Sandworms and Spice. When you hear the title Frank Herbert's Dune, these are probably the first things that come to mind. This is hardly surprising. After all, the sandworm is the most iconic image in all of Dune, and the spice melange, a byproduct of the worm's life cycle, is the most important resource in all of Dune. Indeed, it is the very thing upon which society depends if it is to continue surviving. Therefore, it makes perfect sense to talk about both subjects in the same video. Hello everybody, welcome to Brainstorm Lore, and welcome back to the universe of Dune. Perhaps the best example of demonstrating how sandworms and spice are so interconnected would be a brief explanation of the sandworm life cycle, as it both explains how the sandworms develop and how spice is made at the same time. Your average sandworm typically starts out as sand plankton, small, near-microscopic organisms that feed on spice that has been scattered about by the adult sandworms. Eventually, the sand plankton develops into these diamond-shaped flatworm-like creatures, bafflingly named sand trout. The sand trout live beneath the surface, looking for spice to consume or water to eliminate, as water is lethal to adult sandworms. When water is found, the sand trout begins to mix it with excrement from their own bodies, and this combination results in what is called a pre-spice mass. Frustratingly, this is only described very vaguely as some kind of fungusoid. The pre-spice mass continues to absorb this mixture of water and sand trout excrement, all the while releasing gases that eventually build up to the point where it bursts to the surface of the desert in an explosion known as a spice blow. Those sand trout that survive the explosion enter a dormant state and metamorphose into immature sandworms. Meanwhile, the pre-spice mass, now absorbed to the light, heat, and desiccating conditions of the deserts of Arrakis, becomes spice melange, which can now be harvested, albeit with great caution, as sandworms are sensitive to any kind of disturbances on the surface and will attack the source of any rhythmic movement. For this reason, the locals of Arrakis, the Fremen, have learned to, as they put it, walk without rhythm, so as to travel in safety across the sands. This seems perfectly sensible, since I doubt any sane person would want anything to do with the business end of a worm longer than most skyscrapers are tall, especially when said business end is full of row upon row of crystalline teeth, so hard and so sharp, that the Fremen like to use them as cutting weapons. Fortunately, while a sandworm will consume just about anything that happens to fall into its gaping maw, its diet seems to comprise mostly of sand plankton. Like many real-life terrestrial worms, the body of an Arachian sandworm is comprised of many segments. If severed from the main body, the segment can survive on its own, albeit by separating into individual sand trout. The adult sandworm is covered in heavy scales that are too thick to be damaged by any conventional weaponry. Atomics are said to be the only weapons capable of killing a sandworm outright. However, an individual scale can be prized loose by use of a Fremen tool known as a maker hook. When the scale is prized loose, sand and grit gets at the soft skin beneath, which irritates the worm. The sandworm will then rotate its body so that the exposed skin is as high off the ground as possible, as far away from the sand as possible, and it will not submerge until the maker hook is removed and the loose scale pops back into place. In this way, some of the more daring Fremen are able to use the worms as temporary transports. This is especially impressive when you consider the fact that the typical sandworm can grow as long as 1,500 feet in length. Though some reports claim that worms in excess of 3,200 feet are said to exist around the planet's southern pole. I really like this last detail especially, because it sounds like Frank Herbert is doing his take on the classic theme of maps with blank areas labeled, Here There Be Dragons. In fact, the dragon parallel makes a lot of sense. A giant, monstrous animal standing between humans and something valuable that they really want. Which, of course, leads us back to the spice. Only in the 1960s could you write one of the greatest sci-fi stories ever written and have it be about drugs. In a fittingly strange way, it kind of makes sense that while Dune is certainly well respected, it hasn't been able to achieve the same kind of broad appeal that Star Wars or Star Trek has. 
It was a weird book about a weird universe written during the weirdest decade of modern history. Of course, spice melange is more than just one hell of a drug. It is essentially the social and economic linchpin of the Dune universe. Some have even interpreted the spice as a metaphor for other essential resources like oil. This isn't talked about much these days, but back in the 60s and 70s, there was an idea known as peak oil. According to this idea, within 20 some odd years from the 60s, we were going to run out of oil. And as a result, the two great superpowers at the time, the United States and the Soviet Union, would go to war with each other over less and less and less, and ultimately bring about the apocalypse. Both the settings of Mad Max and Fallout are in fact the result of so-called resource wars. Of course, this is all before we figured out new and more efficient methods of extraction, and also before we figured out how to use nuclear fusion as a viable alternative power source. Allegory aside though, what exactly makes the spice melange so necessary to the survival of society in the world of Dune? The long answer would require an entire video in and of itself, but the short answer is this. After the war known as the Butlerian Jihad, the development of any kind of artificial intelligence was declared verboten across all of humanity's holdings in space. The problem was, though, that without advanced thinking machines, interstellar travel was rendered impossible. That is, until spice was discovered on Arrakis by the Spacing Guild. A misconception perpetuated by the David Lynch Dune movie in 1984 is that Spacing Guild navigators, which have consumed so much spice that they have physically mutated, use the spice to fold space itself, allowing interstellar travel. This is incorrect. Aside from extending life far beyond the natural span and turning people's eyes completely blue, the most important side effect of spice consumption is that, in certain individuals, it allows for the development of precognitive abilities, or prescience. What does this have to do with space travel, you ask? Well, despite the fact that it often looks very empty out there, galactic space is actually pretty crowded, and there are all kinds of obstacles and hazards that one has to account for when traveling through it. Consuming such vast amounts of spice enables the guild navigator to predict in advance all such possible obstacles and therefore plot the safest course, without the need for any kind of navigational computer. Paul Atreides, the main character of the first two books, and the Order of the Bene Gesserit also rely on prescience derived from spice consumption. Though what exactly they do with their prescience will have to wait for a video on the Bene Gesserit themselves. The idea of spice granting people the hitherto mystical power of seeing into the future is almost certainly a product of the 60s and 70s, where a lot of people claim to have gained insight through the taking of mind-expanding substances. This is, after all, why so many drug experiences were referred to as trips. However, Herbert was smart enough to point out that, just like real-world drugs, prolonged use of spice comes at a cost. According to the books, spice addiction doesn't really have any actually negative side effects save one. Once you become addicted to spice, you can never be cured. Spice withdrawal is always lethal. And just like a true addiction, the more spice you consume, eventually the more spice you need to consume or else your body will simply stop functioning. To paraphrase a line from the second book, Dune Messiah, spice is like a poison, one so subtle that it doesn't start killing you until you stop taking it. Given the fact that the Spacing Guild, the Bene Gesserit, the vast majority of the aristocracy of the Landsrat, and even the galactic middle class are to one degree or another dependent on the spice, and the fact that spice can only be harvested from Arrakis, it is easy to see why the key to galactic power in Dune is control of the spice. Perhaps the most blatant example of this is seen in the fourth book, God Emperor of Dune. In this book, the Emperor Leto II has not only achieved a complete monopoly of spice, but he has also terraformed Arrakis, making it into a wet green world, thus killing off the sandworms and preventing more spice from being created, and hoarding what spice remains for himself, thus depriving humanity of interstellar travel and imposing on them a period of stagnation for over 3,000 years. This is yet another thing that will have to be explained in a separate video. So I've talked about what the spice does and what it might be an allegory for, but I haven't really talked about what the spice actually is. 
And that's because, in the books anyway, the details are frustratingly vague and sometimes even contradictory. In the movies, obviously, it's depicted as just an orange powder. While it's also a powder in the books, generally, we don't know what it even looks like. All we're told is what it tastes like. Some say that it tastes of cinnamon, and still others claim that the taste changes every time you take it. Mind you, this is a minor detail, ultimately, but it is omissions of information like this that really does irritate an incredibly detail-oriented person like myself. Still, Herbert may have been vague about what the spice actually is, but he is anything but concerning Spice's importance to the Dune universe. And next week, we're going to take a look at the events that made the entire galaxy hinge on the product of a single desert planet. Next week, the Butlerian Jihad. Until then. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, comment, subscribe, and check out our website at studiobrainstorm.net. And if you have a story that you think is worth telling, we are more than happy to help you publish it. Thank you, and have a nice day.